Hard is a habit, but it doesn't have to be. In life, business, and relationships, there's one thing we're all looking for. It's time to change the conversation and change your results, maybe even change your life. It's time for Finding Easier. Here's your host, Chris Westfall. What could be easier than entrepreneurship? Turns out, almost everything. You know they say entrepreneurship is the ultimate expression of creativity in business. And that doesn't mean arts and crafts, it means the process of creation. And today, right now, seven out of 10 Americans are interested in pursuing a side gig. So if you're currently employed or you are an entrepreneur, well, you're either looking for new opportunities or you are looking for new opportunities. And my guest today, I'm very excited to welcome him to the program. His name is Mark Bowles, and he is an eight-time venture-backed entrepreneur. That means that he's gone to the capital markets eight times, and they have said yes. Actually, he's gone to the capital markets many more times than that, but he, they have said yes to him. And in 2013, his company, EcoATM, was the largest non-healthcare company exit in the history of San Diego, $350 million dollars. Mark knows a thing or two about entrepreneurship, and I want to welcome him to the show as we talk about finding easier inside of entrepreneurship. Mark, thanks so much for being here. Glad to be here, Chris. You know, in the course of your journey to becoming an entrepreneur, well, you didn't start out as an entrepreneur. You, you worked at Motorola. And what was that transition like? Was there, was there a moment when you said, I'm an entrepreneur? Or how did that evolve exactly? Um, no, that feeling was nagging at me from the very beginning. I um, grew up in a small family-owned restaurant, really just a greasy spoon uh, in Crystal Beach, Texas. Uh, and, you know, my parents ran it, the kids, myself, we were the staff. And, you know, you go buy the food, you cook it, you wash the dishes, you run the register, and you see the whole cycle of the business and um it makes it hard we did that for about 10 years and it makes it hard to uh become just a cog in the wheel you know one mm. of my frustrations at a big company at motorola was you know these guys over here aren't doing their job and those guys over there are not doing their job and how am i supposed to do mine and i can't tell them what to do and man i wish i had i wasn't just a cog in this wheel and that i could mm. you know look at the whole picture and run the whole picture and so that was the impetus for getting out, but that was nagging at me from the day I got to Motorola. So that, that desire to, to, well, I guess to be your own boss, but, but also you're talking about helping others to, to, perform, to perform better or more efficiently. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's no secret. People in big companies, uh, it's easier to hide. It's easier to not perform as well. Uh, it's easier to lose your motivation. Um, you know, uh, and I like high performance environments. One of the things that um, I was really blessed with is that it turns out Motorola has um, a catalog of products that's so big that no matter what you're building in Silicon Valley uh, that is hardware, uh, you have to buy products from Motorola. You just there's no way around it. And so when I would walk in as a sales guy, to, you know, a new startup, anybody, I did this, you know, half a dozen times a week go visit new customers, big, medium, small, show them the Motorola card, they would invite you back and immediately like tell you their whole business plan and show you their design and because they needed something from me, not me, but from Motorola. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was the proxy. And so I got this, I'll call it a PhD in Silicon Valley by being that bumblebee going to each one of these flowers for six or seven years and um, having everybody tell me their plan. And so by... I'm not that smart, but I was able to absorb all this and then more than that, see pattern recognition. Uh, and the big company guys weren't as passionate about their job and their heart rate was pretty slow and the words per minute when they talk was pretty slow. And then you go see the, you know, the startup guys and they're, you know, thousand words a minute and they're really excited about what we're doing. They're working long hours and they're making a difference. They're innovating. They're running the whole system, not just a cog in the wheel. And I'm like, I want to do that. 
that's what I want to do. And so after six years at Motorola, I went and started my first one. Mm, and, and what was that first one, Mark? And, and how did that go right out of it, the gate? Um, I hooked up with a bunch of uh, uh, guys from IBM, deep in the bowels of IBM research and development that had developed the microprocessor architecture. And um, so we raised some money and I think we started with a $4 million chunk. And um, anyway, built a big company over uh, six years, 80 million bucks. I think we had 130 people at the peak and we actually had a big offer to buy it. Uh, and we were too big for our britches and we said no. And the internet bubble crashed 2000, 2001. And what was worth a, a really big number, uh, 750 million. It wasn't mm. a signed deal, but it was a verbal. We all said, no, we're going to hang on to this and go public. And we sold those assets 18 months later, I think, for $2 million with $3 million in debt. You know, so um, lots mm -hmm. of lessons to learn, <laughs> learn there. But, uh, yeah. Well, you, you know, Mark, you know, you know all the stories. People say that uh, people go into business for themselves because nobody else will hire them. Uh, that entrepreneurship yeah. is uh, a reason to work 80 hours a week so you don't have to work 40 hours a week. You know, all those things that, that you've right. heard. And, right, right. And, and your first uh, trial right out of the gate was a trial by fire. And, uh, and you've described it as a, as a smoking hole in the ground. Um, and, yeah. that, you know, that, that's not far off. And yet, in the midst of that, that the roller coaster ride, because it does, it does take an upswing for you, um, what can you say to folks who are who are thinking about entrepreneurship that could give them some clarity around the what the entrepreneur's journey really is like, and and if you could comment on that aliveness that you felt when you were talking to the folks who are working for themselves and when you started doing that for yourself. Yeah, I mean, I think that aliveness um, at some level there's ego involved, right? It's not just. Um, the way I described it, I, you know, uh, I'm going to run the whole system. I guess there's some ego involved in that, but um, you don't want to be frustrated by people who don't care and sort of gum up things, right? And mm. so you have your chance to build a company with all high-performing people that you get to pick out and so forth. But uh, it is a heartbreaking business. You know, one of the things I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, young, um, old, and you know, there's, it's a really tough, but it's not just all rock star and glitter and fame. You know, there's some low lows in this thing. You have to go out, you know, with this, this ego that your invention, your idea is going to change the world. And, uh, you know, you really want to make that happen. It's not just going in, sitting in a cubicle and doing your cog in the wheel part for a giant company. You really don't affect much. Um, it really is all on you to the extent of even you know, you got to go ask people for money for this vision. You've got to go ask Uncle Joe, Aunt Martha, and your grandmother and your own bank account and other people. Then you got to go take the vision to uh, the employees that you want to hire, the people you want to journal, and they've got to dedicate their life and the lives of their families, right? This is all affected. Uh, and you've got to get everybody involved in your vision with their money and their time and their lives. And if it doesn't go as promised, which it never does, um, mm. there's always ups and downs. You feel like all that's, you know, on you. It is. You started it. You talked them out of their money. You asked them to join. Uh, now, it's a shared vision if you're doing it right. And they put their money in wide, uh, with eyes wide open, knowing that it could fail. You know, they don't all work out. And so, uh, but it still feels personal because you are the one that started this thing out of the ether with your brain and then talk people into giving you money and doing it. So, so it, 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 uh, it hurts when it doesn't work uh, and you feel like you've let everybody down. Right. And so in those times, you just have to get up and dust yourself off and go do it again, which is a hard thing. Um, you know, get on the horse that bucked you off. Right. No doubt. But you've you've been able to do that uh, and and you've been able to bring others along on that vision. I mean, Mark, how important is it to uh, to be prolific. I, I know I know as a writer and the stuff that I do, I mean, the, it seems like the more that I read and the more that I write, the, the better I get at it. Um, that might be a stretch for some of the readers out there. I, I apologize <laughs> if it is. But uh, I find that being prolific and, and letting ideas come through me is what helps me to formulate and see those ideas. And I wonder, how, do, how does that relate to you and your journey as an entrepreneur, as an innovator, to 
is being prolific a part of it? How do you get back up on that horse again? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on what your motivation was when you got into mm. it. I think, um, you know, I think if you uh, are doing it because you don't, uh, you want to be your own boss and, and nobody's going to be your boss. That's the wrong reason because uh, being in a startup, even as CEO, you have a lot of bosses. You got all the investors, the board, and if you're doing it right as the CEO, you're doing servant leadership uh, as part of that. And so it's it's depends on if you got in it just to make money and you failed. Um, and I, I think making money is always a part of it for, for uh, some part of it for most entrepreneurs. But, um, you know, I think... Uh, Getting into it, you know, talking about easier, the title of your book, mm, mm. Um, it's it's not titled easy. It's titled easier because this is hard. Uh, this is all hard. So how do you make it a little bit easier, right? Sure. Um, and I think um, uh, the perseverance part is the hard part, right? You got to get up. and. Uh, but how do you make it easy when you get back up and when you attack this thing again? Uh, one of the biggest uh, cheats, not the right word, but I'll use it anyway. One of the biggest cheats to make shortcut, things maybe? Easier, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> shortcut is uh, to go ask people who would know the answer. I didn't learn this until, you know, you know you're like, oh, I, I'm, I'm CEO. I'm supposed to know everything. And so you're afraid to ask. You know, people just kind of fake your way through it till you make it. And I made that mistake in the beginning where I wasn't really asking enough advice. I was just going to figure it out the hard way, you know, on the job training. And that's a really bad mistake to make. And so I, I grew out of that pretty early on, luckily. But, you know, go ask somebody who would know the answers. One of the things I do in the beginning of uh, any company that I start now is I, I uh, think about the component parts of the business, the channel, the markets, the competition, the IP, the technology, um, you know, the go to market. So you have all these components in this business. Mm -hmm. Think of it as a Rubik's cube with, you know, you got to make so many moves to, to understand the whole thing. Um, you got to be able to understand that Rubik's cube and do that really fast. You know, what's the world record? 3.8 seconds or something. You've got to be maybe not the fastest, but you have to know that. And that comes from time and it comes from studying this and researching it, becoming a geek and a wonk and an analyst and know everything you can about your uh, business, your topic and each component of it. And the way to do that as quickly as possible is to go ask people that know. And so curate in your mind, who is the Elvis of the channel for this new business I'm starting? And you go find that person and you ask them to help you, to give you advice, because um, it's amazing, you know, I figured this out later on is, you know, you think these people won't talk to you, but if somebody spent their life, their 10,000 hours becoming so good at one thing, all you have to do is push the button and most of them will just tell you everything and they want to help, right? And once I discovered that, that was that was a big deal because now I didn't have to just sit on the internet or sit in a, at a coffee table with two people and trying to figure the world out for this business. I could go ask the Elvis of this component, this component, this component, this component, and then uh, know the answers uh, and build that simulator in my own brain quicker than I could learning things the hard way. And it literally shapes years off and, you know, maybe a round or two of funding uh, and you just get there faster. And so that's a big, um, a big cheat. And it's not just go find those people and talk to them. It's surround yourself with them all the time, permanently, make them part of your board, your advisory board, your team, have an expert, world-class expert in everything that you do if you can, or as close as you can to that. And it sounds simple and stupid, but most people don't do that. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah. Talking about having, having that, that one conversation that's gonna make things easier. And you're, and you're looking for that Elvis person out there. I mean, you know, it's interesting. You're, you're, you say you're looking for Elvis. I mean, Mark, you've got over a hundred patents to your name. I, I, don't, I don't know that you're Elvis, but you're at least John Bon Jovi. <laughs> so. I don't know about that. I'm not sure the girls would agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you are living on a prayer. I don't know. But my point is this. Um, 
my point is this, that, well, and it's, it's your point as well. You understand the importance now that you have achieved what you have achieved of, of giving back. And you've done that. You've done that at Pepperdine. You've done that at, with uh, universities there in San Diego. You've done that at Texas A&M, which is where you know, we first connected. And, and you continue to give back to, to entrepreneurs. And, and you're generous with your time, generous enough to share your ideas here. And now you and your son are in uh, an yeah. entrepreneurial venture together. And, and you're creating a, a legacy for your ideas. And, you know, I, first of all, congratulations on that and on what you and Miles are doing once again. Uh, but I'm curious, Mark, would you consider yourself a creative person? How creative are you? Yeah, I do. Um, and it's, and it's uh, you know, you said, you described in the beginning, you said it's the ultimate expression of creativity in business or something like that. Yeah, yeah, right. I think it might be, it might be it might be the ultimate expression of creativity period because you know i have a lot of uh people in my family they're you know poets and uh mm -hmm. authors and uh mm -hmm. and you know that's sort of classic creativity but if you think about um if you think about when you d do a startup if you think about just the visual art stuff that you have to do the design of your product you know, it's almost like sculpture. You have to be involved in that. You have to be creative about it. You hire people to help, but it's up to you. And then the beauty of your website and the beauty of your app and the beauty of your user interface. Sure. These are all really deep exercises in, in creativity. And then all the copy that you have to write and how you have to tell the story or the stories of your business, that is an art form. And so I can't think of any other creative pursuit that requires so many different components of being really, really good at it. You know, you got to invent stuff and you know, patent it and write software that's creative. There's so many vectors of creativity required to make this. Um, I, I think I'm as you know much, and most entrepreneurs are as much of a creator or artist as any artist or musician thinks they are, right? Um, Indeed. And that's, you know, that's, uh, I think I can back that up quantitatively. <laughs> I would agree. I would agree with you. You know, I, it's interesting you talk about that because I, I, I was having a conversation with, with my coach. And uh, when I was in the process of, of writing uh, easier and uh, I was just sharing with her some frustrations, some things that just weren't, weren't working out. And we were uh, kind of playing a game of not it. <laughs> Like, I don't like this. I don't like that. Not it, not it. I don't like that. I wish that would change. I wish she didn't treat me that way. You know, all those kinds of things that we go through from time to time. And my coach said to me, in the midst of this frustration, she wanted to shift me towards uh, creation, you know, and, and seeing opportunities in the midst of the mess. And she said to me, Chris, what if it's all writing? And, I, and it was a pattern interrupt for me, right? So I stop and I'm like, what do you mean? What if it's all writing? I mean, you know, uh, I guess I'm writing a story that I don't really like the way that it's turning out. And she's like, yeah, what if it's all writing? What if you have the capacity not just to, you know, bang out words on a keyboard, but to craft your own story and, and not just a story that goes in a book or a story that goes in a pitch in front of investors, mm. but in the, in the story of your life. And just as one of the things that I discovered in writing this book was that, you know, that I could tell you exactly where chapter three came from. And the answer is chapter two. You know, you have to, you got to go through <laughs> yeah. chapter two to get to chapter three. And, uh, you mm -hmm. know, that was, that was a real eye opener for me was to say, what if it's all writing? And she, she wasn't saying like, you know, you can, um, you know, script what other people are going to say or something like that. But she was saying, what if it is all creativity, the process of creation? And uh, mm -hmm. that's that's what that's what I see that, that you have done, Mark, and that I admire so much. Uh, you know of what you've been able to create, and you continue to create. And you and Miles are working on a, an innovative new project. And uh, I just I just applaud you for what you're doing, uh, not just for what you're creating, but but how you're giving things back. It it really speaks to yeah, yeah to your values. Yeah, it's it's the only thing I know. And you know I, I talked before about when I figured out to go ask other people that would know. It sped up everything for me, and so now I'm that person. I'm, you know, anybody that wants to talk about entrepreneurship, whether it's uh, going to prisons, um, universities, uh, guest lecture, uh, incubators all over the place, uh, networking groups. It's all that I 
really do with my time is uh, because it's the thing that I know and it's the one thing I'm have some confidence that it's worth sharing with other people, right? Mm -hmm. um, you don't want me to teach you how to write a book or uh, paint a painting uh, or a whole list of other things, but it's the one thing I spent you know my whole life doing. And you ask me, and I'm going to tell you, and that's the point of my sure. earlier you know shortcut is is ask people that might know, right? And I don't know everything, and I might be wrong about a lot of it, but um, I probably have some experience in most of the stuff that you're. Um, you know, I'll get you in the right compass heading, sure. give or take, you know, 90 degrees. That's right. Uh, Absolutely. Start there. Absolutely. Well, creativity takes many forms, many forms. And some of those forms are patented and some of those forms are software code. And some of those forms are our paintings and books, for example. Right. But, you know, the thing for me, when, when we let life come through us uh, is when we when I feel most alive, and I would suspect it's yeah. the same for you. It seems to be an aspect of human nature. And, you know, for, for folks who are with us and who are watching us today and listening to this, this conversation, if, if you feel that you have something that you want to create that's, that's, that's waiting to come out inside of you, listen carefully to what Mark said. Have mm -hmm. the conversation. Don't be afraid to go out and find the resources because that is the ultimate resourcefulness. And, and you don't have yeah. to go it alone. You don't have to go it alone. And, and, it, and it feels like that. I mean, I'm, on a, I'm an entrepreneur too. And sometimes it feels like you're on, you're on the island of entrepreneurship. And if you, know, and you fall right. into that trap, if it's got to be, it's up to me. There's no one I can call. I must figure this out all my... Come on. What? That's yeah, that's crazy. the biggest fallacy there is. I mean, we have this note. We celebrate, you know individual entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs or, you know, Bill Gates, or it was team, this is a team sport sure. and, it, and it always has been. Yeah. There's people who, uh, you know, uh, are legends like that, that did, but it was a team. It was a team of people and there's good leaders and there's better leaders and so forth, but it really is a team sport. And, you know, the Socratic process of this stuff is so complex and there's so many components to it that not one brain is going to be able to do it all best. You know, you really need to have a tight team of people, at least in the beginning, that have different skill sets, different perspectives, and can share those in a creative way that's not a top-down thing, but it's a you know a group exercise because it just it's just too much to to do alone. And so here's the other thing that I would say that's a uh, a shortcut. Um, really good people you need really good people to join you this team spirit the socratic process of building these things to accelerate it um they want to work on a vision and a mission that's noble that they like and they want to be able to tell their family and friends that when they go to work they're doing something noble right um and so of all the ideas that you can come up with uh put them through the filter of is this make the world a better place? Does this, will other people join you and put a little bit more effort when they put their shoulder to the wheel because uh, it's a noble thing and their family's proud of them and their investors are proud of them and their friends are proud of them and they can stand up at Christmas, you know, and say, yeah, we're building this and we did, you know, this great thing that changes the world, makes it a better place. Um, the tailwind that's created by that is, you know, of course, People need to build uh, military drones. Um, you know, you could argue it's a noble mission or whatever, but it, uh, or bomb fuses or, you know, whatever. There's things that um, aren't going to, like, get people as excited to come join you to go do it, even though the world might need those. Um, but do something noble that changes the world to make a better place. And I'm telling you, you're hiring and you're, even your fundraising and your uh, effort is is much stronger that way, and everybody will be behind it. So outstanding, outstanding. So finding that noble goal, finding that that impact, and and approaching things from uh, from the standpoint of the Socratic method, which I, I love that. You know, and if somebody's listening and thinking, well, that's all Greek to me, the Socratic <laughs> method is it's simply it's asking questions, it's asking smart yeah. questions. And, and not being afraid of that conversation. Make sure that if, if entrepreneurship is in your future, that, and again, I'm, I'm speaking to the, to the folks who are with us, make sure that you're having the conversations that matter with people that matter around yeah. something that matters. And 
that makes entrepreneurship easier. Yeah. 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 Get rid of the nonsense. And, uh, you know, a lot of this is, um, is mimicry and learning mm -hmm. how, you know, successful entrepreneurs think. And so surround yourself with successful entrepreneurs and people who've done parts of your business and, um, and your odds of getting good advice and, uh, uh, you know, for your business are, are really high. And particularly if those people are around you all the time and it's right. an ongoing process. Um, so it makes it much harder to fail and failing sucks. It's not something you want to go spend five years, six years and 80 million bucks and, uh, and then have to go back and get on that horse again, right? It, it's it's uh, painful. And so avoid that if you can and avoid that by surrounding yourself with good people who understand what you're doing and can help you um, do this uh, again. It's your business. Yeah, failure sucks. But in a world <laughs> where failure sucks, well, second chances uh, are available if you learn yeah. from what it is, if, if you yeah. learn from your mistakes or you learn from observation. And, and one of the things that, you know, and you and I have talked about this in other forums, learning how to learn, which is about seeing patterns that others don't, not just, not just matching patterns, but, but learning from, from patterns of the past so that you can create the patterns of the future. That's, yeah. that's the pattern that you want to match, especially as an entrepreneur. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, the pattern take recognition takes a, a little while to build up because, you know, if you haven't seen very many patterns, you know, the 10,000 hours, right? That's right. Um, so you get smarter with each one. But again, there's a way to accelerate that by borrowing from the patterns that your mentors have seen <laughs> from their experience. And, you know, so you don't have to learn everything the hard way, uh, I guess, is the point I wanted to repeat again on that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also one of the one of the pattern recognitions that helped me over time was, and I think we make this uh, mistake as as humans, all of us do, not just in startups and everything. There's this whole field um, uh, study called behavioral economics. Daniel mm -hmm. Kahneman and uh, yeah. Dan Ariel, Ariel and other folks uh, that fascinates me. But um, one of the places where humans fails fail in their thinking quite often, and particularly in startups, is um, recognizing the complexity of the problem first that you're trying to do. Because mm -hmm. we tend to simplify it and think it's much simpler. And sometimes it is. But one of the first things I've learned to do now after studying some of the you know, behavioral economics is like, on a scale of 1 to 10, I don't know the answer to this problem, but what is the likely complexity um, and then, you know, pick a number and then you can think, okay, now I'm going to need some help. I'm going to have to go talk to this expert or that expert or whatever. But if you just, you know, go into it, ah, we got, we got this. Um, often you don't, right? Um, you know, the concept of thinking fast and slow is the name of one of these books. Right. It is, um, you really have to get the complexity right first. So you'll never arrive at the right answer. And it's usually more complex than you think. Um, the problem, I mean, the answer might be simple, but the problem is usually more complex than you think, right? And so, so anyway, um, I just throw that anecdote in that helped uh, my thinking on this quite a bit. No, I love that. I, you know, entrepreneurship, in, in a way, it's sort of like, like, it's sort of like a word problem. I mean, you know, the way that you set up a word problem determines how you will solve it. And being able to step back and yeah. look at it, I, I love that. I love that perspective of on a scale of one to ten. How difficult is this? What what really is involved? And you know, Mark, you're really pointing people towards their own resourcefulness to be able to find mm -hmm. the resources that they need. And and I want to thank you for being a phenomenal resource once again today, for sharing your insights, for opening the conversation about how to really face into the challenges and potentially the upside of entrepreneurship because there is a way to, to turn headwinds into tailwinds. There is a way to turn a setback into a comeback and you're living proof of that. And I wanna thank you again for being a part of the story here on Finding Easier. You're welcome, Chris. It's a great book and uh, you captured a whole lot of really good concepts in there that um, will save people a lot of pain and suffering if they just read it and uh, pay attention to those. I, I tended to learn things the hard way myself in the beginning. I wish I would have had your book about 20 years ago and it would have saved me a lot of trouble. 
Well, thank you for saying so, my friend. You have some amazing insights, Mark. And again, I'm, I'm grateful that, that you're willing to take the time to, to share those ideas. And for those of you that have taken the journey with us, hard is a habit, but it doesn't have to be. Easier always exists, even in the midst of complexity. And entrepreneurship, I don't know that there's anything more complicated or more satisfying. And if that's the journey that you're on, I wish you every success. Remember, you don't have to go it alone. And part of making things easier is turning to the resources that can make a difference for you in your journey, not only in the way that you set up that word problem, but in the way that you solve it. My name is Chris Westfall. Thanks so much for watching.